interesting look at commodities gold. Uh, the one improver at the moment, only just silver and copper. A little bit weak. We're going to talk about copper in just a few moments' time. And North Korea, of course, which is what James is referring to, has been warned not to treat nuclear threats as a game. The UN Secretary General made the comments as Pyongyang said it plans to restart a mothballed nuclear reactor which is able to produce bomb-grade plutonium. Washington has said the move was extremely alarming from there. Uh, Sky, uh, Sky's UK, sorry, US correspondent, apologies, Amanda Walker reports. In Pyongyang, it's business as usual. Media censorship means citizens aren't privy to what the rest of the world is reading and hearing. The headlines are emblazoned not on the internet, but state-controlled billboards. The mission is, of course, as with this banner, to praise their lionized leader, Kim Jong-un. Our nuclear strength is a war deterrent, he says, a guarantee to protect our sovereignty. Kim Jong-un, just like his father and grandfather before him, is determined to rattle the sabres of the West. His plans to boost Pyongyang's nuclear might waved through despite the consequences. And this is what he's reversing. The nuclear plant shut down, and persuaded Washington that North Korea wasn't a state sponsor of terrorism. Panic may not have set in just yet, but patience is certainly waning. There's a long way to go between a stated intention and actually being able to pull it off with all that that would entail. Uh, but, you know, were they to be able to put themselves back into a position to use the facility, that would obviously be extremely alarming. But as I said, it's a long way from here. The Yongbyon reactor was the country's sole source of bomb fuel until it was closed down in an international disarmament deal. By the time it shut in 2007, engineers were thought to have got enough plutonium for at least six warheads. North Korea says its scientists will also begin work at a uranium enrichment plant at the site. Both materials can be used to make nuclear-tipped missiles, and after weeks of threats against Washington and South Korea, that's causing international concern. Nuclear threats are not a game. Aggressive rhetoric and military posturing only result in counteractions and fuel fear and instability. So is war imminent? Washington doesn't believe Pyongyang's scientists have the technology yet to build a nuclear-tipped missile that can reach the U.S. But with its allies South Korea and Japan far closer, they're not taking any risks. This may be billed as a routine military exercise in the region, but the deployment of stealth bombers is unprecedented. Provocation may be, or depending where you stand, a necessary precaution. And U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has held a joint media conference with his South Korean counterpart. He has reaffirmed America's alliance with South Korea and described the North's leader as dangerous. What uh, Kim Jong-un has been choosing to do is provocative. It is dangerous, uh, reckless, uh, and the United States will not accept the DPRK as a nuclear state. And I reiterate again, the United States will do what is necessary to defend ourselves and defend our allies, Korea and Japan. Uh, we are fully prepared and capable of doing so. And I think uh, the DPRK understands that. Well, joining us in studio now to talk a little bit more about the impact on commodities is Pete McGuire. He's from NG Farrah. Good morning to you. Good morning, Brooke. Good morning, actually, James. Just to refer back to James's <laughs> comment earlier, geopolitical concerns, and yet we haven't actually seen that oil price move too much. Why is well, that? Well, in some ways, I think it has. You know, it's bounced pretty strongly from that $89 level we saw a couple of weeks back, back to 97 Brooke. And really, the US dollar, I think everyone was very focused on the Cyprus out, what was happening over there. Um, from a geopolitical standpoint, the Middle East is still bubbling away. Uh, and now you've seen a little bit of heat coming from Southeast Asia as far as Korea and, and so on. So it's all underpinned and uh, I think WTI has rallied fairly strongly. Brent, the, the gap is, is narrowed to around about $13 between Brent and WTI. And what's that 20... saying? I just think that there's been momentum as far as the, the US oil market more so than Brent. We haven't seen that strong uptick as far as what Brent went down to around about 107, 108, whereas WTI was $89 only a couple of weeks ago. So why then? Why is one? Why is Brent not moving in the in the same sort of think, uh, pace as we've seen with with the nine? Well, I WTI. think I think principally, James, the the major reason was that WTI was oversold to the downside, and there was a very large price divergence between the two um, crudes. 
got to around about twenty to twenty-two dollars, and that's since narrowed down to thirteen bucks. Um, principally, the issue at play is that WTI was oversold and it's caught up. Mm. Let's go to copper because we were talking last week about a lot of bearish bets being placed on copper. Yeah, maybe with the hedge funds and so on. The hedge funds, exactly. So maybe not unsurprising, you're starting to see that copper price come off. Yeah. What's been the, I mean, overnight it was down a percent. What's been the trend, though? You know, one of the big things is China and the US and the growth is stuttering over there. They're saying, I know that the equity markets are doing quite well, but when you look at orders coming through and there was a little bit of oversupply in the market, that's since taken an effect. And we're only seeing that, you know, factory reports are showing that that growth is, uh, is contracting and you're seeing that um, copper market now around that, you know, 73 to $7,500 a metric tonne. That seems to be the, pretty much the range at the moment. I would have thought with crude oil getting that uptick, it may have taken along its brother copper to some extent, but it certainly wasn't the case. So is well, exactly that is that painting a more bearish picture about the global economy? Well, if you what, roll that, that across to steel is? production, and I mean, there's got to be a linkage between copper and steel, certainly. You know, when you see the largest steel manufacturer come out yesterday and say, the chairman that is, that bio, bio steel, there's been over overproduction and overcapacity on the market is probably too, uh, uh, just has too much sheer steel, then you're seeing a softening of that market as well. So that going along with copper, um, it just seems to be taking a little bit of a you know, sideways to negative stance at the moment, Brooke. Do you see that turning around? I mean, in particular, copper, it's, it's such a, a, global a global economic barometer. Absolutely. I mean, do, do you see a turnaround there or do you see ongoing concerns, particularly out of Europe with some of the data we've had recently continuing to wait, or is it just a supply-demand issue? Uh, I think, well, first off, you've got a, a softening of that whole Eurozone, and I don't think there's no, there's no real sunshine over there at the moment. Um, I think it's going to be a lot... It, prob, I'm not going to give you a time horizon when it gets back to $10,000 a metric tonne, but at the moment, it seems to be fairly... Um, con fairly confined between that six and a half to eight thousand dollar trading range, and I don't think there's going to be any great breakouts on either side due to the current market. I would have really thought, with the equity markets the way they were, that would have been an uptick for it and would have taken it along. But that hasn't been the case because everything that gets manufactured, from motherboards on computers to um, to every part and parcel, as far as you know, production um, has some component of rare earth or certainly base metals included. So where would you be bullish? I mean, if people look for some sort of commodity, maybe buy an ETF, get some sort of an exposure. I mean, what do you see as the near-term move that to keep an eye on? Well, I think that what you've seen is that crude market has been very strong over the last, you know, best part of a week and a half to two weeks. And I think you could see a continuation. I wouldn't be surprised to see WTI this early in the year, considering it's only April, uh, we're still a month and a half out from the summer driving season or a month out. And then, you, you know, that hurricane, that traditional time of year, if this geopolitical starts to gain some more momentum in that Southeast Asia region, you could see WTI at 100 or $105. So that could mm. be the place to be, James. All right, Pete, got to leave it there. Great yeah, as always sure. to talk each, on each Wednesday morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you, James. Stay with us here on Trading Day. Coming up, we'll take...